All right. So, in the title, we, we could not figure out what to teach you guys or what to tell you all today. So, I said, well, can you hear me? Am I loud? Okay. So, what I thought was I'll just go ahead and talk about what is happening in the cath labs. I mean, as you guys go through your surgical residencies and um, anesthesia, uh, these are the things I need you to all to know you know, for the next year. So, so first, there are top five things. So the first number one thing you all ought to know, again, these are things happening in the cath lab. These are patients who are going to, you guys are going to see at a later stage or maybe because somebody crashed. So first is coronary angiography, IVIS, OCT, FFR, IFR. This is what we do in the cath lab to assess coronary artery disease. So if you look at coronary angiogram, the obvious things are obvious. LAD, RCA, CERC, I'm not going to get into all those things. What is the number one limitation? What's the number one limitation? Any guess? Coronary angiogram completely underestimates plaque burden. How much narrowing does it have to be before stenosis happens on an angiogram? 40%. And that happens because of positive remodeling. Human arteries are designed to accommodate blood flow. So it keeps on expanding. So you almost sometimes have to have 40% plaque buildup before luminal narrowing happens. And remember, what we are doing is luminogram. And that's why there are these issues with overestimation, underestimation, and so on and so forth. The second challenge also poses is surgical targets for you all. Because like this is an example of an RCA. And I had sent this patient for bypass surgery. Well, as it turns out, the Lima was done to the LED. There was a vein graft to OM. However, they could not graft it RC because I was so surprised when I heard that there was nothing, tar you know, nothing surgically revascularizable. However, this entire RCA was diffusely diseased, severely, severely calcified. So coronary angiogram doesn't tell you the whole story. So there are ways we have tr tried to learn a little bit more about coronary arteries. Is it working? Okay. So the first thing we have started doing, for example, in that coronary artery, we ran this IVUS. And in IVUS, we can actually see what seemingly looks like a, again, the photographs are not great, but what seemingly looks like a healthy section of the artery is severely, severely atherosclerotic with a lot of calcification. The hyperechoic shadows are the calcium and this is all atherosclerosis. So you can all see that with an IVUS, which normally on an angiogram you can't. OCT is another new technology you guys will keep on hearing about, and that is one of the highest resolutions. We use that a lot after we have deployed a stent, and we are worried about restenosis, we are worried about um, dissections and di disruptions of those plaque. In this one, this is the OCT catheter. That's our wire, and the wire creates a little bias. But what you may be able to see are those stent struts. So this artery already has had a stent. Now what is happening inside the stent? You have all this intimal hyperplasia. So this is all re-narrowing. Even though it looks really nice and good, this is all at least 50% restenosis in this artery. And that's the benefit of doing OCT. But probably the biggest advancement in the cath lab in the last three, four years is FFR or IFR. So remember, whenever we are doing angiogram, whenever we're looking at lesions, we are doing, lo looking at them in a resting manner. We see an intermediate stenosis, 50, 70 percent. We don't truly really know whether it is stenotic or not. And that actually becomes very re relevant for the surgeons too. Because I would have sent patients to Dr. Rule and we would say, well, is that LED significant or not? We recently had a case like that. Now, sometimes if you were to do an IF FFR, you can assess the hemodynamic significance of their intermediate lesion. FFR is almost done like a stress test is done. You know how you guys have patients go through stress test. Have you heard of Lexiscan or Regadenosin stress test? So what Lexiscan or Regadenosin does, it, it causes hyperemia. All the coronary beds become hyperemic. It kind of almost creates a stress like metabolism of the heart. And when we do that, we can actually see any differences in diastolic coronary blood flow. And 
Based upon that, studies have validated certain numbers. So for example, this is an example of an RCA where an FFR was done for this lesion. And after adenosine injection from resting to hyperemic state, you can actually see a separation. And it comes to 0.85. Then there is another LED lesion here where something similar was done. And the FFR comes to 0.68. Now, you can argue, well, is this bad? Is it 50 percent? Is it 60 percent? If I were to probably ask 10 cardiologists, some would say 50 percent, some would say 70 percent. But remember, you have to talk about dropping in lemas and things like that, so very relevant information. So we are doing more and more of FFR. As you can see in this particular artery, the FFR is 0.68. So just for simplicity purposes, remember 0.80. That's your cutoff. If you ever get reports saying FFR is less than 0.8, that lesion is deemed hemodynamically sig significant. Please put in a bypass graft. Okay? There is also another new technology called IFR. IFR is where we don't have to inject adenosine. IFR is where we don't have to inject adenosine, but we get a catheter based diastolic pressure waveform differentiation. And in that one, the number is 0.89. IFR is a relatively new tool. You're not, you're not going to see that much yet. Very few labs around the country have it. But what you're going to see a lot is FFR. Actually, there are insurance companies which actually ask interventional cardiologists to say, will you do an FFR if the lesion is deemed intermediate? So it's become a very common part of our practice. In your generation, you guys are going to see a lot of FFR reports. The second thing I want you to know, so first thing was CAD and imaging. The second thing I want you to know are stents. I think it's relevant for your field to what's happening in the cath lab. We'll talk about where the stent has evolved, bare metal stent to DES, first, second generation. There's something called biodegradable polymer, bioabsorbable, and talk a little bit about depth therapy. So <clears throat> things have evolved a lot. Remember, we have been doing angioplasties since the 70s and 80s. And in the 90s, we were doing mostly bare metal stents. So from POBA, bare metal stent allowed us to keep the artery open. You would have less, quote, quote unquote, emergencies of perforations and dissections. However, we had a massive issue with restenosis. In 2003, by the time we got to drug eluting stents, restenosis is reduced. So what, what is the current state? And this slide only takes you to about 2006, but this has only gotten better. So for example, PCI failure, where we can't do it. I mean, it used to be 40%, and now it's barely 2%. In our cath lab, PCI failures are probably 1% to 2%. Emergency bypass surgery. Again, because of better equipment, obviously the biggest advantage is the stent, which creates a permanent scaffold, has gone down significantly to 0.5 percent. Restenosis. This is probably the biggest important advancement in interventional cardiology, and thanks to drug eluting stent technology, it has gone all the way from 40 percent. I mean, 40 percent is where we would put in a stent and hope it would not restenose. Now it's down to 10 percent or even 7 percent. In today's world, if some company wants to introduce a new stent, and if their restenosis rates are more than 8 percent, nobody's going to use it. So 92 percent of the patients at one year don't have restenosis. And that is one of the reasons why cath lab volumes are down, because there was a time when I was a fellow, every third patient we were dealing with was restenosis. But we don't see that anymore. Stent thrombosis, because of advances again in stent design, but also the antiplatelet therapy has significantly reduced to about 0.5 percent. And very late stent thrombosis, which is kind of a new thing we have identified in the last decade or so, has been steadily declining also. This usually means after the first year. So what are the stents you guys got to be aware of? What are the names? <coughs> so this is what Cypher was kind of the first drug eluting stent. It was approved in 2003. Texas came out in 2005. Endeavor was there for a brief time. But these are the current, the ones in the green are the what, what are you guys going to hear about. 
I want to point out some subtle changes or advances in the stent designs and technology. This is what has allowed our field, interventional cardiology field to advance is this very slide. For example, we have moved away from stainless steel. So if somebody presents to your data on a stain, stainless steel stent, you have to almost kind of think twice about it now because we have found much better alloys, uh, cobalt nickel, platinum chromium, cobalt chromium. Strut thickness is almost halved from 140 to 150 microns. Now anything more than 80 microns is kind of scoffed at. Polymer is, polymer is nothing but a plastic we apply on top of the stent to uh, give the drug uh, molecules. And that as you can see also has become thinner. The drug choices have moved from paclitaxel and serolimus to what I call evrolimus and zotarolimus, some, something which has the best healing power. We actually now believe that drug elution or the drug is only required for three to four months. Anything beyond that is unnecessary. Anything shorter than that could be harmful. Now, beyond this, there are two other stents which are approved in USA, which you will probably encounter in your clinical practice. The first is a stent called Synergy. In the Synergy stent, it's kind of very unique. We sit down with the biomedical engineers and say, well, I mean, yeah, we are happy with the drug eluting stents, the science and promise you, you have given us, but let's make something better. So A, we wanted to make thinner strut. The second thing we wanted to do was put the drug only on the arterial wall side because any drug where the blood flow is inside the artery is kind of wasted. Not only that, wherever you have to put drug, you have to put this polymer. And as I said, polymer to us is nothing but a plastic. Like you buy an iPhone, you put that little shield. That's what polymer is. It cracks, it webs, and so on and so forth. So it causes chronic inflammation. So to get away from that, we kind of say, well, hold on, do we, do we really need to put polymer on the blood flow, the luminal side? Because that is where the endothelialization is happening. And if you are cracking that polymer, it's not going to, the cell is not going to form very well. So we try to create this abluminal polymer. But then there is also this thought about, gee, this polymer, we require that drug for three to four months. Why keep that polymer there forever? maybe we can come up with a biodegradable polymer. So now we have this polymer on the abluminal side, which biodegrades at three months. So the polymer is gone. This becomes a very thin strut, bare metal stent. The drug elution has already happened. As I said, it's only for three to four months. And after three to four months, all you have left in this particular artery wall is a 78 micron stent. So this is kind of one of the newest advances <coughs> in the stent technology. The second thing which is approved in US, which is kind of the first iterations, in a way also in the first generation in US, is the Absorb. You guys may have heard of that. There's been a lot of news. Absorb is a completely bioabsorbable scaffold. It is made out of PLLA, polyalectic acid. So once in the body, it actually dissolves through the Krebs cycle. It takes about two years for it to completely dissolve right now, maybe even three years. The strut thickness, as with the first generation, is very thick. So remember I talked about how thin the str st struts have gotten? Well, this is still at 150 microns. We have some markers at the end because we can't really see this on angiogram. So if you guys ever see an angiogram with an absorbed stent and has been sent for surgery, you won't be able to see the scaffold, even if it was just <coughs> implanted two days ago. All you'll see are platinum markers right here at the end. It's basically just a plastic PLLA. It uses a Rolimus drug, and again, um, it kind of dissolves completely at two to three years. The reason this has not become, in a way, has not had too much of market penetration is because we are seeing high stent thrombosis. So normally, as I said, stent thrombosis of 0.5% is all that is allowed, all said and done. Well, in the data, in this particular trial showed 1.5%, so much, much higher, very high rather, than we would be comfortable with. But I think there is, there is this is possibly one of the things in future, in 10 years by the time you guys are practicing out there, you'll see many more patients getting absorbed um, because there are so many, almost 12 or 14 varieties of these devices happening right now in Europe. 
There are a couple of them coming to US in trials in the next few months. A quick note on DAP therapy because few, few things have changed. <coughs> in June 2016, we kind of rewrote some of our guidelines. So normally all you may have heard is G DAP is required for at least one year. That is old news. The only time DAP is required for 12 months if it is the stent is done in the setting of an ACS. ACS means MI, STEMI, non-STEMI, somebody comes to the ER with unstable angina, those are ACS. Then it doesn't matter what type of, even a bare metal stent, because there you are treating the disease pathology. You're not really treating the stent, you're treating the disease pathology, because studies have shown that patients who are present with ACS have a very high reinfarction rate within the first year. To prevent that, we recommend DAPT for 12 months, irrespective of the type of stent. However, if the DES, drug eluting stent, is done in non-ACS setting, somebody, you know, gets a stress test in their office and, and we do a cath and put in a stent, then the DAPT is only required for six months, okay? And these are all relevant because not only you guys will be doing surgery, cardiac surgery, we also vascular surgery. And a lot of our patients have cardiac and vascular problems. So a lot of those patients, you'll have to sometimes wait for six months in the ideal world if you, if you believe in that. In patients who are going for surgery, we recommend Plavix or Belinda to be stopped five days in advance and FPN for seven days prior to surgery. Our surgeons will tell you there are ways institutions work around this, there are platelet assays you can do, and so on and so forth. But this is the general guidelines. All right, number three fact I need you all to know. Left main stents. It's a hot topic. Uh, I'm just gonna quickly go through some of those because you'll probably learn a lot more about this. So Syntex was a landmark trial. Syntex basically looked multivessel coronary artery disease. Some of them also had left main and we kind of started looking at that. And PCI was inferior to cabbage for the composite primary endpoint of death, MI stroke, or unplanned revascularization. So as you can see, <coughs> death, MI, and stroke, um, but especially the what drives the most is the revascularization, which is much, much higher in PCI arm. But we kind of started digging deeper. You know, that's what cardiologists do. So we started, well, let's try, try to divide the anatomy. I mean, not every multivessel disease is the same because sometimes we come across 3.5, three lesions, and we say, well, this, this stents should really do well. So when we divided those patients into tercels, we gave them syntax scores. And if you guys do not know this, please make sure you know syntax score. Very vital for, for surgeons as well as cardiologists. So when we started dividing into three turtles, we saw that the lowest score, the one with the least complex anatomy, so to speak, the differences were not as pronounced compared to somebody with very, very complex anatomy, which was kind of intuitive or expected. But then the other thing we kind of started questioning ourselves is that we use taxes in this particular trial. So it's really not relevant today. I mean, nobody uses taxes anymore. We have very high event rates. And as I just wanted to show this slide because we, we kind of have this very important differentiation of events with the Zion stand, which is what we use nowadays versus taxes of a significant delta. So we do much, much better than Texas. So then we said, well, let's create a study design which uses the current generation stent. And that was called XL. So XL was again unprotected left main disease. Without going into too much details, half of those patients, about 1,000, went to PCI, half of them went to cabbage. And the primary endpoint of death, stroke, and MI at three years, not at one year, but three years, as you can see, is no different. In conclusion of Excel, we would say that treatment of patients with left main coronary artery disease and low or intermediate syntax score, kind of less than 32, with the Zion's particular stent, result in similar rates of primary endpoint of death, stroke, MI at three years, with fewer adverse events within the 30 days compared to cabbage. And those adverse events, you know, infections and, and atrial fibrillation and so on and so forth, the rehospitalizations. What that has allowed us to do is offer left main to certain patients, stents. But it should not be practice, it should not be standard of care. 
However, we believe that PCI may thus may be considered as an acceptable or even a preferred revascularization modality for selected patients with left vein coronary artery disease. A decision which should be t made after the heart team discussion and we make sure in our institution we do that regularly, taking into account each patient's individual circumstances and preferences. The fourth thing I would like you to know about is coronary CTO PCI. There are, CTO is becoming more and more relevant nowadays. When we do a cath, almost 20% of our patients have coronary CTO in some artery. And one of the, that's one of the commonest reasons for us to send them for bypass surgery. Again, I'm making you guys aware of this particular data is because it's becoming more relevant, something which we are doing much more commonly. Because even when we send them for bypass surgeries for varieties of reasons, whether it's to disease down, downstream or just the conduit is not really good, almost one third of them actually don't get bypassed. And that often is the main reason we are sending those patients to bypass surgery. We'll see an LED 70% and RCS CTO. So that being said and done, we, a lot of things have happened in the last five years. CTO interventions have advanced a lot. And this is, apart from the new wires we have, the crossing catheters we have, we also have this techniques of what is called dissection reentry. So we basically push a wire through the plaque and then get into subintimal space. And there's a catheter called Stingray, which allows us to re-enter distally here. And then we actually create a stent in the subintimal space. The second thing, well, this is an example of this particular, this is a vein graft going to an LED. This was a 60-some-year-old patient of mine who has already gone through two open heart surgeries. This was a degenerative LED vein graft, which already has two, three stent procedures. And as you can see, the vein graft fills the distal LED. From the second catheter, you can see the proximal LED. And it kind of is completely occluded there. So what we did was we brought this stingray balloon, which has a side hole, which allows me to come beyond the occlusion and then kind of re-enter, as you will see the wire progressing forward from the side of this actual balloon. And when we do that, this is that example of that re-entry. This allows us to put in a stent after this. There are also retrograde techniques. So now we can go from LED to RCA, vice versa. We use septals. We can also use epicardial, but the commonest approach is usually septal because it's very safe for us. CTO interventions are increasing from a success from about 40 to 50 percent in the 80s or 90s. Now we are up to 80 percent. Our institution is about 85 to 90 percent. So this is an evolving field with a lot of progress. The last fact I want you guys to know is CHIP. You will hear about this every time you go to our conferences. There will be a session on complex high-risk interventions. And the reason this title has been created is because we have gotten better at supporting our patients, patients who require um, very complex interventions because of high-risk anatomy, very calcified disease, or they are in cardiogenic shock. And often that may be the last conduit, like every other bypass is gone, there's only one vein graft or some lima hanging there. And those patients, when we do a balloon or rotor, rotor ablation, they get very ischemic with transient LV dilatation, they drop their blood pressure. So to prevent all that, a hemodynamic support, we used to use uh, balloon pumps, we kind of have fallen out of favor. Pretty much all our high-risk interventions, we would use an impella like system. So as of today, there are always options for our patients. If I send it to our surgeons, it's always cabbage, but we can also say we can do it from the wrist. The patient remains confused, but bottom line is create a heart team wherever you guys go. Good luck. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shah. He's got to go downstairs.